it's a very complex disease with a lot of complications and it's putting it has a lot of burden it has put a lot of burden on our society you can see that so what is diabetes diabetes mellitus is a chronic condition that is characterized by raised blood glucose level which is also called hyperglycemia so a condition which causes increased glucose is called diabetes mellitus how is regulation of plasma glucose level done? It is a tightly regulated procedure. It by means of hormones. The main hormone which causes the decrease in levels is the plasma of the plasma glucose is insulin. And those which causes increases the glucose levels are glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol, and the growth hormone. So only one hormone is responsible for down regulating the glucose levels, and that is insulin. And how does it do it? It does it by having a negative effect on the glucagon. So it decreases the release of the glucagon. And it causes uptake of increased glucose uptake by the muscles and by adipose tissue. It also causes, affects the liver and cause, decreases the glucose production. So whenever there is high blue blood glucose level, Pancreas will cause the release of the insulin, which will inhibit glucagon and which will tell the liver to stop producing the glucose. While on the other hand, will ask the muscles and adipose tissue to take up the glucose and this in turn will reduce the blood glucose levels. Classification of diabetes. So diabetes is classified mainly as type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes was formerly called as insulin-dependent diabetes and juvenile onset diabetes, which was because it was considered to be a diabetes of younger age group of children, but now the concept has changed. Number 2, the type 2 is diabetes which is combination of insulin resistance with relative deficiency in insulin secretion so there is resistance to the effect of the insulin and for which is for followed by the loss of insulin production so it was uh, type 2 or in roman 2 was given to it then it was previously before that was the name was given to it was non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus because it was the one which was being treated by the oral hypoglycemic drugs at that time or it was initially in the very beginning it was named as adult onset diabetes because it was thought that it was the disease of the adults but now with the obesity pandemic we know that um, uh, that, that type 2 diabetes can be seen in younger children in, in children young as young as two to three years old then we have gestational diabetes which develops during some in some cases of pregnancy and disappears after pregnancy then there are other types like secondary dm because of the chronic pancreatitis or acute pancreatitis or surgical procedures and there's damage to the pancreas so we have secondary dm or infiltration of the pancreas because like in hemochromatosis or there is LADA and MODI. The LADA is latent autoimmune diabetes of adults and MODI is majority on such diabetes of young. We are not going through them right now and I will talk about them in, a, uh, in my next lecture which will be about the diabetes complications and I will also touch these three over there. These, these the gestational diabetes, LADA and MODI in that lecture. So, what is the etiology of type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease which causes selective destruction of the beta cells by T cells. There are several antibodies which are acting against these B cell, beta cells, and these antibodies are like islet cell antibodies and anti insulin antibodies, anti GRAD antibodies. These are the antibodies which are, act which are in the body and they affect them and causes the destruction of the beta cells. What exactly is the cause of this autoimmune attack? We don't know. Both genetic and environmental factors can play a very important role. So what can be the envi environmental factor? Very vi many viruses have been uh, uh, considered as cause of this, like Coxsackie virus, mumps, and rubella. 
while like cow milk and nutrients uh, is the cow milk which has been considered producing the antibodies so babies when they are when you start giving them cow milk they develop antibodies mm -hmm. to cow insulin and this insulin then with these antibodies then they start acting against the human insulin so cow insulin is similar to human insulin and then this results in attacking the beta cells so that's how it happens uh, type 2 diabetes is run because of impaired insulin. So type 2 diabetes is a different entity. What happens is in basically what is uh, the cause of type 2 diabetes is that the insulin is being produced but it is not being effectively used by the body. So there is impaired insulin action because of which there is decreased utilization of the glucose by the muscles and the adipose tissue and there is increased glucose production by the liver so uh, this is because of the impaired insulin the body keeps on producing the insulin and it keeps on producing and there are high levels of insulin and due to excessive production of the insulin the, the beta cells they can exhaust and this this dysfunction of the beta cells or death of the beta cells takes place and then there is impaired insulin secretion in patients they've moved toward complete uh, deficiency of the insulin from higher level of insulin to complete deficiency of insulin in type 2 diabetes mechanism of hyperglycemia so how does hyperglycemia occurs in diabetes in absolute there is or type 1 diabetes or in relative type 2 diabetes when there is insulin deficiency there is increase in hepatic glucose output and a decrease in peripheral glucose uptake and utilization so the muscles and adipose tissue cannot take it up and the liver keeps on producing it so decreased insulin will cause decreased inhibitory effect on glucagon secretion thus increase glucagon and this increase in glucagon it will in turn act on the liver causing gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis which both will result in increase the plasma glucose levels so one way of having hyperglycemia is increased production of hepatic glucose under the influence of glucagon then there is decreased uptake because if insulin is not there muscles will not be able to take the glucose up so decreased glucose and amino acid uptake and increased protein breakdown will lead to increased plasma glucose and plasma amino acids so the glucose is not being taken up so that's causing increased level of plasma glucose the proteins are broken down so this leads to increased plasma amino acids adipose tissue decrease insulin increase lipolysis decrease lipogenolysis and decrease increase plasma fatty acid levels so ketoacidosis which takes place is because of that insulin deficiency so what is the characteristics of type 1 and type 2 diabetes in different scenarios we have percentage of diabetic population only 5 to 10 percent have type 1 diabetes more than around 90 percent people have type 2 diabetes age of onset in type 1 is usually younger age group less than 30 years and in some adults that is the LADA which appears in adults and type 2 it is usually above the age of 40 and in case of the obese children we also have another entity known as um, double obesity double diabetes it is a condition in which a children who have type 1 diabetes but because of their family dynamics they put on weight and as they put on weight they develop type 2 diabetes as well so the new category of double diabetes is also coming in pancreatic function usually is none in type 1 and it's in type 2 insulin is low normal or high so it all depends on the stage of the type 2 diabetes pathogenesis it is an autoimmune process in case of type 1 in type 2 it's the defective insulin secretion or there's tissue resistance so increased hepatic glucose uh, outcome so that there are many mechanisms in type 2 his family history is not strong in type 1 it is very strong in type 2 
obesity is not in common in type 1 usually type 1 have weight loss severe weight loss obesity is a common presenting feature of type 2 diabetic patients history of ketoacidosis is often present type 1 mostly present type 1 diabetics mostly present with ketoacidosis a young boy a young girl for the first time at the age of 13 and 14 will be coming to er with abdominal pain and there will be keto acidosis on investigations and then the sugars will be checked they will be very high very first presentation of these patients is ketoacidosis most of these patients in type 2 rarely except in stress or at the end when the type 2 reaches to the burnout stage when the pancreas is completely burned out that is the point when type 2 patients they also start depending having ketoacidosis so older age groups of type 2 we see very commonly ketoacidosis in them clinical presentation in type 1 is usually moderate to severe symptoms the polydipsia polyuria polyphagia the three p's are there fatigue weight loss and ketoacidosis while in type 2 the symptoms are mild it is polyuria and fatigue and diagnosis is on routine physical examination treatment type 1 insulin 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 there is no other treatment besides insulin you have to replace insulin in these patients and then you give do the diet and the exercise in type 2 diet and exercise is the first thing you have to make them lose their weight some people who are at the border of it they will be just just uh, little higher levels just having the 6.5 hb1c that's the cut at the cutoffs of the type 2 diabetes will have will improve uh, with with diet and exercise and then the oral antidiabetics insulin and then your di anti-diabetic mortalities there are many we have the diabetes in the field of diabetes the pharma pharmacy the the therapeutics has boomed in the last few years and there are many drugs to be talked about so in epidemiology it is as i said type 1 is due to pancreatic islet cell b cell destruction predominantly by autoimmune process develops in childhood or early adulthood 10 percent of all diabetic patients and as a result of exposure to genetically of genetically susceptible individuals to environmental agents so it genetically usme problem thi aur phir koi environmental agent koi virus aake laga usko aur uski wajah se uski susceptibility thi pehle se aur usko exposure hua aur usko type 1 diabetes ki antibodies bani aur woh destruction start ho gayi Type 2, it results from insulin resistance with a defect in compensatory insulin secretion. Insulin may be low, normal or high. 30% of type 2 diabetic patients are undiagnosed. They don't know that they have disease because they're mild. 90% of all cases of diabetes are type 2 diabetes. Risk factors, genetic predisposition in type 1 and then such virus or toxin exposures can lead to this. In type 2, family history important, obesity, physical inactivity, previously identified if they're impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose. So then there is a chance they have they are at high risk if there is hypertension and hyperlipidemia then there is high risk of having type 2 diabetes so how carbohydrate metabolism takes place carbohydrates are metabolized metabolized in the body to glucose and this glucose and then used up by cns our brain uses the glucose and this uptake by the brain is independent of insulin it doesn't require insulin for that glucose is also taken up by muscles to produce energy and muscles need insulin to do that glucose is stored in liver as glycogen and in adipose tissue as fat insulin is produced and stored by the beta cells of the pancreas so what happens after the food is ingested blood glucose concentration rises which stimulates the insulin release insulin in turn causes the increased glucose uptake by the tissues increases glycogen formation decreases the glycogen breakdown increases lipid synthesis and inhibit fatty acid breakdown to ketone body promotes protein synthesis in turn the glucose levels of the blood glucose levels they start falling what happens in the fasting state in fasting state insulin release is inhibited so your body doesn't have 
your body realizes that there is no more glucose in the blood. So the blood glucose, when as it starts falling, then the insulin release is inhibited. And hormones that produce the, now the hormones which are responsible for increased production of the glucose in the blood, they are released from the body, like glucagon, epinephrine, growth hormone, glucocorticoids, thyroid hormone. There is glycogenolysis, so whatever glycogen was stored, it come, starts coming out of there and there's, uh, it, it starts breaking down and it is converted into glucose. Gluconeogenesis, amino acids are transported from muscles to liver and they are converted to glucose. Triglycerides are broken down into free fatty acids as an alternative fuel, of, fuel source. So when you don't have glucose, the free fatty acids are used and triglycerides are the ones which are broken down for it. So again the same thing, type 1 is absolute deficiency of insulin due to immune mediated destruction. In rare cases, it's not due to immune mediated, it can be called idiopathic. So we can see in this picture this uh, insulin producing cells, the blood cells, the insulin is being produced, and the cells, these beta cells, they are quite nicely arranged around the arteries and they are capillary, sorry, and they are producing the insulin over here. This destruction of the insulin producing cells and so no insulin is there in the blood. There are four stages in the development of type 1 preclinical period with positive beta cell antibodies. This is just beta cell antibodies. They don't have symptoms. Then when 80 to 90 percent of beta cells are destroyed, we get a hyperglycemia phase. Then there is a transient remission where patients, they go into remission and they start producing a little bit of insulin, which they have. It starts working and this is known as honeymoon phase. And after that, the fourth stage is the establishment of the diabetes. So we can see this is the beta cell mass, which is 100% at the time of the birth and at time in years as the year passes. Because of the genetic predisposition and immunological abnormalities, we start seeing a fall in this mass. It is falling, the mass is falling down, but still the beta mass is going down, but still the normal insulin has been released. And patient remains asymptomatic without any problem he goes on in life. That is the point, 80 to 90 percent of when beta cells are gone, then the symptoms start appearing. But after appearing the symptoms for some time, some patients, they develop a honeymoon period. So some kind of reserved beta cells, they start functioning and then therefore people don't have these symptoms. This can last for a year or two, or six months or a year or two. And then uh, after this, over diabetes. So 90% of the mass is lost. So when type 1 diabetics are discovered, when they are presenting with diabetic ketoacidosis or with any symptoms, their 80 to 90% beta cell mass is gone. So they are completely, they will need the treatment at any cost. They have to be started on treatment. Type 2, the presence of both insulin resistance, insensitivity, and some degree of deficiency or beta cell dysfunction. It occurs when a diabetogenic lifestyle, excessive calories, and intake is too much, eats too much, inadequate and inadequate calorie expenditure, meaning no exercise, sedentary lifestyle, and obesity, the weight gain, is superimposed upon a susceptible genotype. So there is a genotype if it's running in the family, so this gene is over there, and then person is not having good lifestyle, he is sedentary, he eats a lot of fast food and and he's obese, he's getting obese, so he will develop type 2 diabetes. So insulin resistance will be there. It is, uh, develops, the patient has initially has obesity, pre-diabetes, diabetes, and then uncontrolled diabetes, hyperglycemia. And so we start, patients start developing insulin resistance. And with this insulin resistance, he starts having macrovascular diseases. So zero is the point when you have discovered the patient has diabetes and this is the time when he doesn't know that he has diabetes. So you can see the insulin resistance is still there five years before he has been discovered as having diabetes and he has developed the macrovascular diseases. Beta cell initially with insulin resistance, beta cell failure is not there, they are there and this starts at the time of diagnosis, they start having the failure of the beta cells. 
and when there is failure after 15 to 20 to 25 years of having the disease the insulin level starts declining that's the time when we start giving them the insulin and you can see as the beta cell go down the post meal glucose start coming up and it's the fasting fasting in glucose which starts coming up a little a little later than the post meal ones and this is the time when microvascular diseases start affecting and developing in these patients so what are the lab tests glucosuria to detect the glucose in the urine by a paper strip it's a semi quantitative and it depends on the normal kidney threshold for glucose if the kidney has some defect is already diseased so then this cannot be much of use ketonuria is to ket detect ketone bodies in urine by a paper strip it is again a semi quantitative test then uh, the much better to do to test for ketones is ketonemia that is the test of for ketones in the blood because the uh, uh, there are three types of the ketones which are present in the blood uh, in the body and amino is uh, the acetoacetic drug uh, is the one which goes into the urine beta hydroxybutyrate is the one which remains inside the blood uh, is remains in the blood and is not excreted in the urine so beta hydroxybutyrate is converted to uh, acetoacid uh, acid and then uh, sometimes if you don't have ketonuria the ket if the ketonuria has settled down you have to check the blood because the beta hydroxybutyrate might still be there and patient might still be in ketonemia so ketonuria will tell about you about ketone the ket amino acidic uh, acetoacetic acid in the uh, in the or the acetone in the urine it will not tell you about the true uh, ketone levels true ketone levels will be detected by doing the blood sample and looking for ketonemia fasting blood glucose glucose blood concentration in samples obtained after at least eight hours of the last meal so you have to do eight hours of the last fasting eight hours fasting is must for a fasting blood glucose random blood glucose is a glucose blood concentration in samples obtained at any time regardless the time of last time of the last meal so whenever you take the blood regardless of the meal last meal for fasting it has to be eight hours of fast glucose tolerance test is the most accurate test for glucose utilization especially in the patients who have borderline levels fasting levels what we do is give a 75 gram of glucose to the patient with 300 ml of water after an overnight fast and samples are drawn at one two and three hours after taking the glucose HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin is formed by condensation of glucose with free amino groups of globin, globin component of hemoglobin. It comprises 4 to 6 percent of total hemoglobin. Increase in glucose blood concentration increases this hemoglobin fraction. HbA1c reflects the glycemic state during the preceding 8 to 12 weeks or 2 to 3 months. So, jo patients get in. तीन महीने की शुगर जो चेक करता है टेस्ट वो ये वाला है एच बी एम एन सी सीरम फ्रोक्टोजमाइन इज फॉर्म बाय ग्लाइकोसलेशन ऑफ सीरम प्रोटीन मेनली एल्बुमिन एंड सीरम सिंस सीरम एल्बुमिन हैज शॉर्टर हाफ लाइफ देन हीमोग्लोबिन सो इट इज फॉर 2 वीक्स नॉर्मल इज बिटवीन 1.5 टू 2.4 व्हेन सीरम एल्बुमिन इज 5 ग्राम पर पर जीएल when is this done it is done in patients whose hemoglobin level is not appropriate so someone with anemia iron deficiency anemia will have low hemoglobin so the hba1c will not be accurate so their fasting sugars will be high but they will be having low hba1c and people will be and we will be misdirected that patient has doesn't have diabetes or his diabetes is controlled in fact the patient is having anemia this can be iron deficiency anemia or thalassemia uh, so in such cases serum fructosamine helps uh, in uh, following in follow up of these patients
So self-monitoring is very important in the, for the patients because by self-monitoring is the process with which patient will understand his glucose levels, his insulin requirement, his diabetes, he will come to know. This is one of the best practices which we have to be, which we have to advise the patients of the diabetes and they have for strict glycemic control. So it's extremely useful for outpatient monitoring, especially for patients who need tight control. A portable, portable battery operated device that measures the color intensity produced from adding a drop of blood to the glucose oxidase paper strip. So we have paper strips, glucose oxidase. You might have seen many of you have diabetic patients at home, your grandparents or your parents, you might have seen this. So you just prick your tip of the finger, put it on the strip and the strip is then inserted into the glucometer and the glucometer then measures the uh, level so this is how it is done they prick the tip and this so there are many such one touch aqua check dex prestige precision many companies are there which are available for this uh, from which you can get, get these glucometers uh, they're very cheap and we advise most of the patients to have this now the newer thing in this is the continuous glucose monitoring is a very fancy there's there's a patch which has a sensor it is placed on the forearm sorry 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 so it is placed on the forearm so it was it continuously in the subcutaneous so it continuously measures the glucose level and it has a fancy this kind of a device with which the sensor uh, transmits so the sensor transmits the um, readings and the device tells you now what is going on is now we this there are several apps which you can download on your uh, on your mobiles and these sensors can be connected to those apps and they will give you a continuous glucose monitoring these con CGMs have revolutionized the uh, glucose monitoring uh, these can also be uh, connected with the laptops of, or with the uh, hospital management and doctors in their hospitals can have a look at the patient's continuous glucose levels and can advise them about their treatment. It is very useful in type 1 diabetic patients or patients who have been put on insulin. So it plays a very important role. It is very, very helpful for them. So what's the diagnostic criteria for diabetes? Symptoms of diabetes plus casual plasma glucose concentration or the fasting or the random plasma glucose of more than 200 milligram per DL or fasting plasma glucose of more than 126 milligram per DL or 7 millimoles per liter or two hour post load on OGTT is more than 200 milligram per DL. Any one test should be confirmed with the second test, most often a fasting plasma glucose test. This criteria for diagnosis should be confirmed by repeating the test on a different day. So two tests should be done and then it should be repeated on some other day as well to confirm the diagnosis. Any of these three can be used when and one of them is and the second test which should be done should be preferably a fasting plasma glucose test. So how do you categorize the glucose status? Fasting plasma glucose is normal when it is less than 100. It is called impaired when it is between 100 and 125. And it is diabetic fasting plasma glucose. Patient is labeled diabetic if a fasting plasma glucose is more than or equal to 126 milligram per DL. Two hour post load plasma glucose or oral glucose tolerance, normal plasma glucose is less than 140 post load. Impaired is 140 to 199 and patient is diabetic if the levels are more than or equal to 200 milligram per DL. So we have talked about this, type 1, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, the clinical presentation, weight loss, weakness and dry skin. And this ketoacidosis can be the very first presentation of type 1 diabetics. Type 2 diabetic patients can be asymptomatic, can have polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, poly fatigue. They will be having weight gain. When type 2 diabetic patients start 
who is on treatment starts having weight loss develops the polyuria polydipsia then you have to consider that there is they are now developing insulin insufficiency uh, insulin deficiency and now they need they will be needing insulin treatment both patients are discovered while performing urine glucose screening so most patients discovered while they are performing urine glucose screening excuse me so what are the desired outcome what do we want in these patients we want their symptoms to be relieved we want the mortality to go down we want to improve the quality of life and most importantly we want their microvascular and macrovascular complications to reduce the risk of having them is reduced and the damage being caused because of diabetes is reduced what are the macrovascular complications is a coronary heart disease strokes and peripheral vascular disease microvascular complications is the retinopathy nephropathy and neuropathy we'll be talking about them in my second lecture so how to treat these patients a very very busy slide you can see very important very very important for the clinicians uh, what is advised is you start with monotherapy unless the hba1c is greater than or equal to 9% so if it is more than 9% then you have to consider the dual therapy or unless the a1c is more than or equal to 10% and the glucose levels are more than or equal to 300 or patient is markedly symptomatic consider combined combination injectable therapy that is the insulin or non-insulin injectable therapy you have to think of so if the hba1c is less than 9 you start with the monotherapy but starting before going off to this monotherapy, the first thing you have to do is the lifestyle management. So lifestyle management at any level of HbA1c is the first line of the treatment. You have to advise to them. So if HbA1c is less than 9%, 6.5 to 9%, actually 6.5 to 7%, you can advise the lifestyle management and you can see and then from 7 onwards, you give metformin. Metformin is the first line drug. Metformin, which comes by the name of glucophage or neophage, is the drug which has to be given. Initially, it was said to the obese patients, but now obese, not obese. Type 2 diabetic, start metformin to these patients. It is found to be very effective has low risk of hypoglycemia, do not cause weight gain and it usually helps in weight loss and keeps the weight normal. So it doesn't have a bad effect on weight. The main side effect is the gastrointestinal effect. So it causes GI disturbances. Lactic acidosis is also mentioned and it has, but it has not been seen that much, but it causes lactic acidosis. If A1C is not achieved, you give metformin for three months, and if it is not achieved for three months then of monotherapy, then you do a two-drug combination. Order is not meant to be to denote any specific preference. You can do any one of these, and this can also the the these drugs. There is a list of these drugs, and you can choose any one of them depending on the patient and patient's requirement and patient's condition. So one of the drugs uh, like sulfonylurea, you can give to the patient if the patient is not obese because sulfonylurea can lead to the weight gain. And uh, a patient who has heart failure, you will not consider giving thiazolidine dions to this patient. Then uh, a patient, uh, you can give DPP-4s, this SGLT2s have shown uh, those with cardiovascular disorder, you can give them those having ischemic heart disease, then SGLT2s have been considered better option, it's a better option. Here, uh, there is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, the, which have a very good side effect that is weight loss. 
so they have been waste loss so uh, on all those types who diabetics were obese and they need weight loss you can start with glb1 to them and then the insulin basal insulin can also be added to these patients again you give the combination metformin plus sulfonylurea metformin thiazine and metformin or dpp4 so metformin or sglt2 so metformin and sglp1 or metformin or insulin whatever combination you're giving you see these patients for next three months with the duo therapy and if not responding you proceed to the third drug and this again the order is not like this one and then go to this and then this and then this no you can choose according to the patient's requirements so if hb1c not achieved approximately three months of triple therapy and patient is on or patient on oral combination move to basal insulin or glp1 so you have two three options after that if on triple therapy it is not helping so you, what you can do is you can move to basal insulin or glp1 receptor agonist or you can go to GLP-1 receptor agonist, add basal insulin, or you can optimally titrate basal insulin and LGPL, GLP-1 or mealtime insulin. So you have a lot of options. You can juggle between the drugs as the patient uh, looking at the response of the patient. So how will you give the combina combi combination injectable therapy in type 2 diabetic patients? So what you do, you will basically do an, a basal insulin. So ba what is a basal insulin? Is the insulin which will cover the basal levels, which will give insulin. You give the insulin for throughout the day. So one dose, in, uh, an agent which will cover the insulin, the basal levels of the insulin, not the perennial. So perennial is what insulin you give with the food. That is the perennial insulin, and the insulin which you give along with for the for for throughout the day which gives the coverage for throughout the day not thinking of the uh, food patient is taken is called basal insulin so you start with the basal insulin with metformin or other non-insulin agent and if hbm1c is not controlled you go to a gl uh, you add a rapid acting insulin the insulin which controls the uh, the perennial sugars that is the sugars uh, rising after taking food or you add the glp1s or you can change to pre-mixed insulin so a mixture of insulin which has a, the rapid acting insulin and long acting insulin you can give them so we're going to come to these insulins and we'll talk about them this is how it has been advised how the therapy should be done so don't get confused we're going to come to these different type of the insulins in the later slides and then you can come back to this slide and have a look at it this then you will understand much better so what is the impact of intensive therapy for diabetes so there have been several trials which have been done world over the major trials which have been done are ukpds and dccd and accord advanced reddit they are mentioned in your books you can go through them what the main thing we have come to know about is that by intensifying the therapy what they saw that all the microvascular it, it that by intensifying therapy there is a very good effect on the micro microvascular complications so all microvascular complications are controlled by by these uh, by intensifying the therapy for diabetes um, but we're not sure about the macrovascular and we are not sure about the mortality as well it has not good effect it has not significant good or bad effect on mortality it has also been seen in accord it was seen that there was excessive mortality by intensifying therapy and this excessive mortality was actually because of the increased hypoglycemic episodes in these patients intensifying the therapy led to hypoglycemias so that's what what we need to be uh, very careful about uh, the, the main complication we have to be very careful in these diabetic patients when we are intensifying the therapy is hypoglycemia which because that can lead to increased mortality so what are the anti-hyperglycemic therapy type or glycemic targets so hbm1c should be less than seven preperennial glucose should be 80 to 130 postperennial should be less than 180 so before meal or fasting should be 80 to 130 on treatment and 
after meal it should be less than 180. We have to keep it in a way that there is no, evident, no incidence of hypoglycemia. Whenever there is hypoglycemia, we have to loosen the control on the glucose. The, this treatment has to be individualized. It depends on patient to patient. You can go for more stringent kind of control from 6 to 6.5 if duration of the disease is short if it is a younger patient who is very healthy very motivated has no complications no cardiovascular disease yet you can go you can sorry you can go for a stringent control of 6 to 6.5 and you can go for less stringent from 7.5 to 8 if the patient has several comorbidities if there is hypoglycemia if he is old age patient if there is less motivated doesn't have support or has limited resources then you have to be you can go for a less stringent control so this is what you see that even if we keep the glucose at hb1c target less than seven percent we see that the control patients many patients are not at this recommended goal of hb1c so there is ominous ominous octet of dmt diabetes mellitus has ominous octet this is the mechanism by which hyperglycemia is taking place in diabetes mellitus type 2. So we have impaired insulin secretion and there is increased glucagon secretion which we have talked about. There is increased high glucose production by the uh, hepatic glucose production the, by the liver. There is increased glucose production. There is neurotransmitter dysfunction. There is decreased glucose uptake. There is decreased glucose reabsorption decrease in critin effect and there is increased lipolysis these are all the pathways which are responsible for the for the development of diabetes and we have now developed drugs which act on all of these pathways and have help in improving this hyperglycemia we will talk about them as we go as we talk about the drugs so first thing to do is the diet dietary advice should, which, which should be given to the pa uh, patients is that their fat should be provided 25 to 35 percent of total intake of calories and saturated fat intake should not exceed 10 percent cholesterol consumption should be restricted to 300 milligram or less daily protein intake should be 10 to 15 percent of the total energy requirement increase for children during and during pregnancy it should be derived from both animal and vegetable sources carbohydrates 50 to 60 percent of total, total caloric content of the diet carbohydrates should be complex and high in fiber so it should have high glycemic it should have low glycemic index glycemic index is when you take a food the rapidity which, with which the glucose levels rises in the body is the glycemic index. So sugar you take and it will shoot the glucose levels uh, at a very uh, rapid rate. So it has a high glycemic index. And the food, their glycemic index is compared to that of slice of a white bread. So the way white bread causes the rapidly raises the blood sugar levels is considered 100 percent uh, is considered the highest uh, glycemic index so drugs the, sorry the food the, the the food substances which when you take uh, they raise the class the glucose levels slowly and gradually there those kind of foods are known as low glycemic and have are known to have low glycemic index so and what are these foods? These are complex foods like your um, um, the, 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 the ones with the high glycemic index is grapes and watermelon, and which are highly sugary foods. While those like um, uh, the other the vegetables, the it, it, they have uh, they have a, a low glycemic index. You can look up into uh, look up for the hyperglycemic for the glycemic index high and low glycemic index foods and there you can get easily get this the these from the net uh, tables or charts from the net 
Excessive salt intake is to be avoided. It should be particularly restricted in people with hypertension and patients with nephropathy. Physical activity is very important. It helps reduce weight and improves the insulin sensitivity. So with dietary treatment and a regular physical activity helps the patients and in controlling their sugars. But it should be according to individual's health status and fitness. So before advising exercise, you have to rule out and you have to look for the complications, tetanomic dysfunction, the cardiovascular disease, and the retinopathy is very important to know. Patients need to be educated about the incidence of hypoglycemia. So because if the patient start doing exercise, maybe the requirement of the insulin, if he is taking insulin, then the requirement of insulin might go down. And if he keeps on taking the same dose, there are chances that he has hypoglycemia. So patient has to be educated before he starts the exercise. So we have anti-diabetic drugs. As I said, they act on all the octate of the diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So we have insulin, the drugs which causes increased secretion of the insulin. That group is sulfonylureas, megalitonides, and incretins. incretins. Then there are drugs which, then there are the, some of the drugs like incretins also play important role in decreasing the glucagon secretion. Then we incretins have uh, effect on the GI and they causes the GI, uh, the gastrointestinal system, and they have alpha we have alpha glucosidase inhibitors over there, which inhibit the uh, the absorption of the glucose. Myelin and bile acid sequestrants, which can again lead to uh, decrease the hypoglycemia. Metformin and thiazolidine dione decreases hepatic glucose output and thus decreases the insulin resistance. Thiazolidine dione also affect the fat cells and decreases the production of glucose. Glucose uptake and utilization is increased by means of thiazolidine dions and metformin. So they are helpful in insulin resistance. Glucose reabsorption is inhibited by the SGLT2. So here the newer drugs which are, uh, which have, we have been knowing about sulfonyl ureas and metformin, thiazolidine dions, even the bromocryptine, it acts on the brain and has a neurotransmitter dysfunction which occurs in the brain if a dopamine, a dopamine system, it affects that and that through that it helps in decreasing the hyperglycemia. So we, we have been knowing about these for decades and decades. These are the drugs, this SGLT2 inhibitors and these are the incretins which have completely changed the face of the treatment of diabetes and diabetes is now going to be in few years the path the the monotherapy the first line drugs they might be changed to these 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 are the dual drugs which might be replacing the old ones in coming future so sulfonylureas stimulate the pancreatic secretion of the insulin there are several generations of these it is about uh, the uh, so first generation is tolbutamide, chlorpropamide, and acetohexamide, which are lower potency drugs, more potential for drug interaction side effects. Second generation is glimepiride, glipizide, and glaburide. They are higher potency, less for the drug interaction side effects. All sulfonylurea drugs are equally effective in reducing the blood glucose when given in equipotent doses. So the, the duration of action is highest for chlorpropamide for 24 to 60 hours they have active metabolite the glimepiride is the one which is usually prescribed nowadays it's a 24 hour duration we can give one to two milligram glaburide or glibenclamide is the one which has been given advice in pregnancy as well they reduce uh, HbA1c by 1.5 to 1.7 percent. Fasting plasma glucose reduction is by 50 to 70, and postprandial is by 92 milligram per dl. Adverse effects is by the main adverse is, uh, is hypoglycemia. That's very dangerous. In old age, most of the patients we have seen coming with hypoglycemia because of this, and then there is a problem of weight gain with this drug. Hyponatremia with tolbutamide and clopramamide has been seen. They also have 
several interactions with warfarin, salicylates, chloramphenicol, electronol, and propanacids. Then we have short acting secretagogues, repaglimide and metaglimide. They cause insulin, they, they cause a glucose dependent insulin. And is, uh, so what happens, they cause the release of the insulin when there is glucose in the body, excessive glucose. And this insulin secretion is decreased at low glucose level. With lower potential of hypoglycemia, they have to be given before meal or with the first bite of each meal. If you skip meal, you don't need to take this drug. So it will only cover if the glucose is raised. Adverse effect, there is incidence of hypoglycemia is there. Uh, but it is low. It uses or inhibitors of cytochrome 3A4 effect the action of repaglinide and litaglinide is inhibitor of the cytochrome 2C9. C Bigonides, the metformin drug, glucophage, which is the drug of choice loved by all the physicians, all the diabeticians, all the diabetologists, everyone, all the endocrinologists. Metformin. What does it do? Reduces hepatic glucose production, increases peripheral glucose utilization. It causes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and anorexia. So you have to build the dose in these patients. You have to, uh, you start with a light dose and then you bring it to the maximum dose, three times daily maximum dose. Fenformin was another bigoinide which was taken off the because it caused lactic acidosis. And because of this, the performance should not be used in patients with renal insufficiency, congestive heart failure, condition that leads to hypoxia. And that is also the reason that metformin is usually stopped in all those patients who have um, myocardial infarctions, the heart attack. So that has it is stopped for usually for six weeks after the myocardial infarction to prevent the, effect, the incidence of lactic acidosis. Glitazones or thioglitazones. These are P bar gamma agonists. These, this is peroxizane proliferator activated receptor gamma agonist, rosiglitazone and bio, bioglitazone. Very effective. They reduce insulin resistance in periphery by sensitizing the muscles and fat to the action of insulin and possibly in the liver. Action of onset is onset of action is slow two to three months causes edema and weight gain and that is the that is the reason that it is not prescribed in patients with congestive heart failure they have they had a very good effect and were, pres were frequently prescribed their use has gone down because of the ins high uh, reported incidence increase in incidence of the blood red uh, cancers with it but, and it also causes osteoporotic fractures However, now newer studies are coming which are refuting the, uh, the, the, uh, the claim that there is increased incidence of the uh, bladder cancers. And these are, but still physician, clinicians are reluctant to use these drugs. And now there are other drugs in the markets which have much, much better uh, beneficial effects which are now being prescribed. So we have glucosidase inhibitors, uh, sorry, this is a little dark in color. So we have acarbose and megalitolol. What they do is they prevent the breakdown of sucrose and complex carbohydrates and thus decreases the postprandial glucose rise. It is effect limited to luminal side of the intestines and limited systemic absorption. So it doesn't cause systemic absorption. It remains within the gut and that's why it's eliminated in feces. Reduces the postprandial glucose. Average reduction of the HbA1c is 0.3 to 1%. The main side effect of alpha glucosidase is it causes a lot of flatulence and a lot of uh, abdominal pain and gases, gaseous distension because it is preventing the breakdown of the sucrose and the complex carbohydrates which are then broken down by the bacteria down in the large gut. Insulin, very important drug. The last drug which has, which is usually patients think that when insulin is given, 
it's end of the life, it's end of the diabetes, there's nothing else could be done for the diabetes. But insulin is one of the best drugs which a patient can have because it is the physiological thing which will be given. This is the thing which body is secreting and this is the thing which has reduced. This is not there in the body anymore in diabetic patients. So insulin is the magic drug for these patients. It is the life drug for these patients actually. So insulin has anabolic effect of glucose uptake, glycogen synthesis, lipogenesis, protein synthesis, and triglyceride uptake. Anti-catabolic is inhibit gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, lipolysis, proteolysis, and inhibit fatty acid oxidation. The number, the insulin commonly available is the U10, U20, and U100. They usually have, we have the U100, the O1 while having 100 units of insulin in it. So there is pork, source is either pork or human insulin. This is no more in use because it used to produce auto -anti uh, antibodies. Now this is the recombinant DNA technology and human insulin is the one which is commonly being, is which is being prescribed. The pork one is no more or beef pork is no more in practice. Onset and duration of effect uh, and duration of effect change it in the properties of insulin preparation. So if insulin molecule is changed a little bit alters the onset and duration of action. So we have Lispro which is a monomeric absorbed to the very rapidly is absorbed. Uh, aspart which is mono and dimeric is also absorbed rapidly so these are short acting ones fast shorter short acting ones regular is absorbed rapidly but it is absorbed slower than the lispro and aspart so this when you are prescribed to the patient you tell them take them with the first bite of the food and this is when you describe them you tell them to take them at the at least 15 minutes before taking food. These are called short acting insulin and these are used basically used for the parenteral glucose or for the rise of the glucose with the food intake they are used. Then uh, there is long acting insulin, uh, lentils or lent insulin. It's a precipitate of insulin with zinc and insoluble crystals of insulin zinc. It is slowly released in the body. NPH which has regular insulin along with protamine zinc insulin so it is also released slowly in the body and then we have glargine it is a modified structure of insulin having micro crystals and it is released very slowly in the circulations this cannot be mixed with other insulins so these are the insulins which are used as basal insulin so these are given once or twice a day, twice a day and they maintain they maintain a, a, a level a, 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 a basal level of insulin throughout the day in the body so what is the side effects this can cause hypoglycemia that is the main side effect so patient has to be aware about hypoglycemic symptoms the the the, the palpitations the sweating uh, the uh, uh, restlessness they and the feeling of taking food and whenever they have hypoglycemia they have to give in, be given 10 to 15 gram of glucose this glucose should be given uh, you, the patient is advised to take uh, uh, juices or he can take a glass of water with two to three spoons of sugar in it or a glucose uh, uh, or we have 15 percent or 25 percent glucose um, uh, ampules available you can uh, that is also given and if patient is lost to conscious then you get IV dextrose to this patient or in one, one gram glucagon I am if IV excess is not available so if you cannot give IV dextrose then glucagon can also be given to them for hypoglycemia so patients at the at the site of this injections they can have skin rash and it is usually more so treatment is to give them more purified insulin preparation Lipodystrophies increase in fat mass can occur at injection sites, so you have to advise them to rotate the sites of injection. 
So there are several drugs which can interfere with the glucose tolerance, disoxide, thiazide diuretics, which are commonly given to patients of heart failure, corticosteroids with autoimmune disorders and several other disorders. You give corticosteroids that can cause increased levels of glucose, can cause hyperglycemia, oral contraceptives, streptazosine, phenotoin, they all can cause the levels of the glucose to go up and monitoring of blood glucose is required in these patients. So how will you give the insulin? You can give insulin with syringes or needles. They can be pen sized injectors and now the insulin pumps, newer therapy. The goal in type 1 diabetics is to balance the calorie intake with the glucose lowering process, insulin and exercise and allowing the patient to live as normal as possible. So you have to maintain the diet with the insulin and exercise, they have to be managed in a way that patient lives a normal life. This is what I was talking about, the perindial. So what happens, there is a surge of insulin the whole day. There's one basal level of insulin, which is not shown. You can consider a line going through and through over here. So an insulin basal level is there, which is there throughout the day. And when a patient takes food then there is surge of insulin so when you have taken a breakfast and the glucose level as the glucose level for, uh, rises the insulin level rises then again as the uh, at lunch you can see there is a when you take the food there is increase in the glucose level and there is increase in the insulin level and then supper or at dinner time again the same thing happens so this is how normally insulin is produced in the body and this is what we try to mimic in type 1 diabetics or in type 2 diabetics when we put them on insulin therapy so the short acting insulin when you give short acting insulin you give it here when the food the patient is taking the food so that short acting will cover the breakfast and then another dose of short acting will cover the lunch and the third dose will cover the supper and the basal, the long-acting NPH or the glargine or lentils which you give will cover the basal levels of the insulin. The line is not being, is not apparent here. This is just a nazar is graph ki line is not project nahi But you can think that there is this basal insulin. It stays like that throughout the day. So for that insulin, to maintain that level of insulin, you give the long-acting insulin to the patient. So the insulin regime has to mimic the physiological secretion of insulin with availability of the self-monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring and HbA1c test. The adequacy of the insulin regime can be assessed. Uh, more intense regime require more intense monitoring. So the more intense the therapy is, more the insulin injections you're giving to the patient, more you will have to do the blood testing of these patients. So there are several examples how you can give. You can give a morning dose before breakfast, give a regular and NPH or lentils, and then you give an evening dose with regular or NPH. Required strict adherence of the timing of the meal. So you fix the time of the meal. Uh, 8 a.m. in the morning, 8 a.m. in the evening, they have to take their meal and their injections. So you can give them twice a day. Or you can, these, and then there can be several modifications in this therapy as well. So at the night, what you can do is that you can also give at the at the meal time you give the regular, and then going to the bed, when patient is going to bed, then you give NPH. You don't give it along with regular uh, regular with the at the time when he's taking the meal. You do it when he goes to the bed, or you can give three injections of regular or rapid acting insulin before each meal, and long acting insulin at bedtime. Four injections. This is the best regime to follow. The choice of the regime will depend on the patient. So how much it depends on the patient, his health, his his daily activities, his uh, his ability to take insulin to work. So it all depends on that. His ability to in, in, inject himself insulin. It all depends on. It. So how much insulin you need to give? A good starting dose is 0.6 units per kg per day. Total dose should be divided 50% for basal insulin and 50% for perendial insulin. And then this 50% perendial insulin is divided into equal into equal three doses. So for example, you have a 50 kg man. So you give a total dose. The total dose will be 0.6, the standard dose units, into the weight of the patient 
this will give you 30 units per day so 50 percent like 15 units should be basal can be just administer one or two doses so when you give one dose you give whole dose together or you can divide this 15 into half and give the two doses and you have perennial 15 units for perennial or for the meals and you divide it into three equal doses so that means five units for the pre-breakfast sorry this one is wrong it's equal doses so five units for pre-breakfast five units for pre-lunch and five units for pre-supper this is wrong this is old regime so you do not follow the 25 percent it's 15 15 it has to be equivalent it will be equivalent so five units in the pre-breakfast five units pre-lunch and five unit pre-supper so how for for type monitoring type one patient requires so 0.5 to 1 unit per kg per day is the most type 1 unit so most type 1 patients will require this much insulin so you you calculated it by 0.6 so you might need to bring it down to 0.5 unit per kg per day so the range is between 0.5 to 1 and it is modified depending on the symptoms of the patient the monitoring the blood glucose monitoring the patient is doing and the hba1c of the patient so according to that you can decrease the dose or increase the dose of the perennial or of the NP or the long acting insulin pump therapy this involves continuous subcutaneous administration of the short acting insulin using a pump so a small pump is uh, is attached to the body and that pump keeps on giving the insulin it can be programmed to deliver basal insulin and spikes of insulin at the time so it can be programmed you can give it will give a continuous a short acting insulin as it's continuous and at the time of the meals the patient can adjust the dose uh, uh, give input to, to the pump that he's going to take that much carbohydrate or food and then the, the, the pump will give the spike of the insulin this requires intense SP, uh, self monitoring blood glucose monitoring and this is the best time when you can do continuous glucose monitoring so most of the insulin pumps are now being connected to the continuous glucose monitors requires highly motivated patients because failure to deliver insulin will lead to serious consequences like diabetic ketoacidosis so this is two ways you take a sample and you see you check the glucose and then ingest the dose or you can use the insulin pump this is the insulin pump which is attached to the body uh, then it has this transducer and then this this this, this is the um, uh, sensor which is attached to the body and senses the glucose levels so the uh, this this is a smart thing insulin pump is very smart he will it will see if the sugar levels are falling it will beep and it will stop automatically or it will beep and advise the patient to stop the insulin and if the sugar levels are high it will it can it can be um, programmed to increase the dose of the insulin if the sugar rises so whenever the sugar will rise it will sense it and increase the dose of the insulin so doses instruction are entered into the pump small computer and the appropriate amount of insulin is then injected into body in a calculated control manner so here it is attached to the body through the clothes and this is the transducer and this is the uh, the sensor which is fixed on the body surgery island cell transplant has been investigated as a treatment of type 1 diabetes in selected patient with an adequate glucose control despite insulin therapy and it has been seen that islet cell transplant have helped a lot of patients so what we do is we take this islet cells from healthy islet cells first HLA matching has done and then healthy islet cells are taken and they are then, then uh, injected into the hepatic vein and which then goes these cells and they go and settle down into the pancreas another is the pancreatic transplant so kidney pancreatic transplant is very is, is also being done and has shown good results uh, i think we can end it now there is a new advances a few slides on new advances in diabetes and treatment um in critins 
what should we do okay uh, let me see how many slides are there uh, how many more slides are there this is it's a few more slides so let's get on with it huh oops 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 oops, oops. sorry 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 sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay, so incretins. We have I've been saying incretins, incretins, incretins. So what is incretins? Incretins is this monsters saliva. So um they were first this is this monster is called gila monster it is found in africa and in north america and what does it do is that it has a venom so it was seen whenever this animal bites someone that patient used to go that person used to go into hypoglycemia so from here we found then the saliva was looked into and the incretins were found so what happens the incretin is glp1 glp1 is the is released from the intestines okay uh, when uh, when we take food this glp1 is released when the food enters in our body from our stomach it this glp1 is released this DLP1 acts on the pancreas. It causes glucose-dependent insulin secretion. So this glucose-dependent means that if there is high glucose levels, the pancreas will release more insulin. If there is low glucose level, the pancreas will release low insulin. It also helps in the synthesis of insulin. It is also re responsible for formation of the beta cells. And then it also causes glucose-dependent decreased production of glucagon. This DLP1 also has effect on liver and decreases the glucose production. It acts on the brain and brain has and causes satiety. So man thinks that he has he doesn't need to eat more. It not only that it affects the brain, it also affects the stomach. And in the stomach, it decreases the gastric emptying. So when there is decreased gastric emptying, the stomach is full and stomach feels because the stomach is full so you feel full you feel a patient feels satiety and that's why it doesn't take more meal and it also has been found to have cardioprotective function so this is the incretin effect the glp1 the new drugs the rocket science of the new drugs of diabetes dpp4 inhibitors so what is dpp4 inhibitors so what happens is that this when this glp1 sorry when this glp1 is released and it causes that so much effects so, so, so many good effects but then there is an enzyme known as dpp4 enzyme which acts on this glp1 and aches it and in, converts it into inactive form that's why because of this enzyme this glp1 has a very short life the short life it has a very sh uh, short life and so we came up the scientists they came up with dpp4 inhibitors so dpp4 inhibitors what they do is they inhibit this conversion they inhibit the enzyme thus prolonging the life of this glp1 and thus the good effects produced by the glp1 in the body so so this is the normal incretin effect when you take the food uh, the oral glucose is given to the patient and you can see the black dot shows the oral uh, the the insulin response after giving the oral glucose so your normal insulin when you give oral glucose in response to this oral glucose there is high insulin release ticket to the oral glucose incretin effect will happen if patient has been given oral glucose so you can see how high how much high insulin this is the amount this is how much high insulin is released in these patients in the normal people when the insulin is when the glucose is given but what happens in diabetes 
In diabetes patients, this incretin effect is diminished. The release of the insulin from the, from the pancreas is reduced. Insulin release is reduced. You can see the, the height of the, 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 the height of this graph. You can see it has flattened. You can see the curve has flattened. <laughs> the curve has flattened in this in the type 2 diabetic patients. There is impairment of the release of insulin to the oral high, uh, glucose. So it inappropriately low insulin is released. This is the so diminished incretin effect is there. So where several studies were done, the TACOS study is the done which was done on cetagliptins. This is a group of this. Uh, this is uh, this is one of the drugs of this group, and it has so shown that it is, was non-inferior and had very good outcomes in patients with cardiovascular disease. So there was no sig signal for increased heart failure or hospitalization in patients who were taking cetagliptin, which is a member of this, DT, which is one of the DPP-4s. So cardiovascular outcomes are very important. With now, cardiovascular outcomes has become uh, the, the targets for the newer drugs. And I will tell you why when we go to the another group of drugs, another new group of drugs. So these are the ne newer drugs which are being, uh, which is which are in DPP-4, the sexagliptin, alloglyptin, cetagliptin, linagliptin. So of these, cetagliptin is the one which is readily available in Pakistan, and it has shown very good effects on the uh, cardiovascular out outcomes. Number two, the drug, which is the second drug, new drug group is SGLT2 inhibitors. And these SGLT2, what are the SGLT2? These are the uh, ch channels which are present in the nephrons and are responsible for reabsorption of the glucose. So we have SGLT2 and SGLT1 um, uh, channels. Two, there are two types of the channels. And SGLT2 inhibitors, which they do is when you use this glucose, instead of being absorbed, is excreted in the urine. So SGLT2 inhibitors reduces glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubules. Okay? So when you give SGLT2 inhibitors, there is reduced absorption of the glucose in the proximal tubules and there is increased urinary glucose excretion and osmotic diuresis. So what happens? You lose your glucose in the urine. So there is excessive glucosuria. Insulin independent action. This is insulin independent. They cannot see whether the glucose levels are high or low in the body. So the incretins has a better effect it has has advantage that they are glucose dependent so if there is raised levels of the glucose they will produce their effect so chances of having hypoglycemia there is low but sglt 2s are the ones which have um, which which are insulin independent so they they do not require insulin and they do not depend on the glucose levels so they improve the glycemia and reduces A1C ranging from 0.6% to nearly 1%, mild reduction in blood pressure, low risk of hypoglycemia, and modest weight loss because of the loss of the water. And dapagliflozin is, in the, is the one which has shown a better cardiovascular outcome. There are studies on this. And they decrease the albuminuria, they decrease the uric acid, they increase the LDL and HDL, they decrease the glucose. So there's a lot of studies going on which have shown that the SGLT2 are one of the one of the better drugs which are coming up and we are, we are now being prescribing these drugs as then. Dapaglyphosin or ampaglyphosin are two drugs which are being used and ampaglyphosin is the one which has shown best cardiovascular outcomes and is the one which has resulted that now all the drugs which are being used for diabetes have to show good cardiovascular outcome. So empaglyphosin and depaglyphosin are the drugs. The more I think, the more confused I get. 
so diabetic th therapy and diabetes is getting confusing day by day so we come to non insulin injectables till now the only injectables used for the treatment of diabetes were insulin but now we have come up with the non insulin injectables and what are they they are glp ones yes these are incretins let me go back to the incretins sorry just quickly do this this is nude stuff and i really like it so this glp1 itself so we were doing dpp4s which inhibit the breakdown of the glp1s but these non insulin injectables are actually this glp1 itself so the very first glp1 was exanatide it was it is a very short acting it has 5 to 10 minutes duration effect and then it affects a finish and uh, it is uh, it action uh, duration of action is just 5 to 10 minutes and uh, therefore it has to be given in continuous infusion so it was uh, and then we found out that exanatide caused uh, pancreatitis so it has been removed from the market and then there were changes done to the molecule of the exanatide and we came up with the drug name liraglutide liraglutide causes insulin secretion in a glucose dependent fashion causes beta cell sensitivity increase insulin synthesis glucagon secretion is reduced hepatic glucose output is reduced increases the satiety decreases the weight increases energy intake it is being available in the by the name of victoza and its body weight effect on body weight is so good that in higher doses is known as uh, Saxenda, and it is being used for weight loss. The liraglutide, in higher dose, and the leader study has shown that it has also has very good cardiovascular outcomes. ठीक है, so it reduces the risk of three point maze endpoints, that is the myocardial infarction, congestive cardiac failure in these patients. Not only that, but it has also shown to help macro macro albuminuria. weight loss and hype and no, there is no hypoglycemia well tolerated and there is no increase in pancreatitis in these patients or hospitalizations this dulaglutide is also known as trulicity is dual and triple oral it can be given a first injectable option in dual and triple oral combination therapies and it is a longer action the duration of action is longer Uh, that's the difference in liraglutide and dulaglutide it's given once weekly dosage it is ready to use pen there's low rate of hypoglycemia compared with insulin glargine and similar rate to liraglutide it is glp1 receptor agonist and shows non inferior inferior hbmc reduction to 1.8 mg so it is not inferior to dulaglutide it is a longer acting drug than liraglutide and is available in the name of trulicity but there it is expensive so it is again the overview these are the studies the award studies which are going on this and dulaglutide is once weekly it is a drug with to achieve and, uh, and it is not inferior to once daily liraglutide Okay, and it demonstrates statistically superior HbA1c reduction. It also resulted in weight loss and associated with lower rate of hypoglycemia versus insulin glargine. There are certain updates in insulin up in near uh, insulin as well. We have near insulins. So these are the rapid acting ones we talked about. Then this is the intermediate one, and these are the longer acting, the ditamer and the glargine. U three hundred, the three hundred units one. These are the analogs which are available in market, and these are the pens with which they are available. We can still improve the insulin by making it faster acting, by decreasing its hypoglycemia, increasing the duration, administration, more convenient injections. More so, more work is being going on on these different insulins. there is also formulations which are coming up which are combination of the of daglutide and the rapid insulin so different combinations are also coming 
of the liraglutide and delaglutide or deglutide and short acting insulin this is these are also phase 3 clinical trials which are going on and um, some of these drugs have also come in the market insulin glargine in higher units is also now available it has shown better effect and it has a 30 hour duration of action it's pres pres available by the name of tojo um, then we do new basal insulins, glargine and lixacinatide and degludeg and liraglutide are also coming up. Solico and zultofi, these are the names. And this is all which is going on in diabetes right now. I'm just telling you these, this, you don't need to worry about it. I'm just, I'm telling you so that you have an idea. We, uh, we don't expect you to remember all of these but you just need to have an idea that there are GLP-1, uh, the incretins, which are GLP-1 and GPP-4. And then there are SGLT-2s, which are acting on the kidneys. And then there is insulin. The newer insulins are coming up. And then there are insulins in which the insulins with these liraglutide or uh, GLP analog, uh, G, uh, the, the modified GLPs, their combination is also coming in the market. Zultofi has is going to be launched next week. So the day you will be listening to this lecture, we'll getting, we, this will be launched in the market, Pakistan's market. So exciting times in diabetes and a lot more for you people to learn and read. Uh, so, liraglutide and empagliflozin reduces cardiovascular risk. GLP-1 agonist and SGLT-2 inhibitors are considered first-line option after metformin. This is going to happen soon, not soon, but in near future. Yes, this is going to be hap will be happening. Many new insulin formulations are there, and they are coming up. But the cost is the problem. Their cost is also a problem. These are readily available, the SGLT2s. These are cheap, but these are very expensive and not readily available. Our patients are getting these from Dubai. Um, and the insulins, the new formulation of insulins are also not readily available. Patient and provider education is crucial to prevent the errors. Thank you. If you want me, this is a very uh, lengthy lecture, I know. Um, it, I have tried to cover a lot in it. If you have any questions, go through the lecture, listen to it, go through the slides. If you have any questions, ask me. If you want me to repeat any part of this lecture, maybe you want me to do the new therapies again, you can ask me to do that in your comments. Um, hope you understand and I'm here for you if you want any questions thank you